Good morning and good afternoon. We're going to get started. We gave everybody a second to get logged in. Welcome to our first social media demystification forum webinar. Uh, so we should have people watching from, uh, from Gmail and YouTube and Facebook. Um, so welcome, and uh, we're very excited to get started here. Uh, today, uh, I'm Amanda Sutt. I'm with Rock, Paper, Scissors, and today I also have Jessica Hazlett here with me. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Hazlett. I'm with Hazlett Group. I uh, manage and execute a lot of our social media campaigns for clients as well as um, execute traditional media as well, and I'm excited to share some how-to and, and tips with you all. Um, and... I guess we can just jump right into it. Sure. Uh, oh, and just to give you a little background for those who are not familiar, uh, I'm Amanda Sutton. I'm with Rock, Paper, Scissors, and we're a branding and web development uh, firm, and we, we focus on small businesses, working with them to make sure they have a solid brand out there. So social media is a very important part of this. So, all right. And um, before we get into the content, uh, we encourage you all to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will answer them at the end. There are a couple different ways you can ask questions. Um, if you have a Google or Gmail account, um, you should see a, a comment section right below the, uh, the presentation if you're hanging out on uh, the Google Hangout. Um, and if you try to write a comment, it's going to ask you to log in. Um, so you can log in and ask a question that way. There is a bit of a delay. It might take 30 seconds to a minute to actually see your question pop up. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, if you do not have a Google or Gmail account and you may be watching this on YouTube, um, you can email us directly at amanda at 123shoot.com. Now is a good time to write down that email address. Um, and you can send us questions throughout the presentation. Um, and the one thing, we are not taking questions by phone. There's a terrible feedback issue between uh, us recording this live and, and picking up telephone. So uh, just keep that in mind. And we, I guess we can roll right into it here. Uh, yep. Our agenda today. Um, Amanda's going to take us through uh, the first two points here. What's your sales process and how can social media help? As well as how do you want your followers to feel, interact, and connect with your posts? And I'll walk us through um, goals and expectations for your social media, media strategy, as well as your brand story and how you want social media to help deliver that message. All right, so here we go. Excellent. All right, so the we're gonna we, we take a step back when we're starting to talk about social media, um, and and I, I deal with this a lot where everybody's so excited to get on Facebook and Twitter and start engaging with people and talking about their product and their brand, but what this all comes down to is everybody runs a business, has a business, and we're in business to make money. Uh, so we want to make sure before we dive into all the exciting bells and whistles and you know having a million followers is making sure what you're doing is actually supporting your bottom line. Um, and so whenever I'm looking at a social media campaign, I like to start with this process is really just going through and going, okay, what it, what is it like to make a, a a purchase or a transaction with your company. So I want to walk through that just a little bit with you guys. Um, good morning and good afternoon. We're going to get started. Give everybody a second on a to second. get logged in. There we go. Sorry about that. We had a little uh, overlap there. Okay. Um, so a little bit to go into the sales process, and this is something to start to think about, is past sales. Uh, so let's think of the, you know, quintessential 1950s gonna go buy an appliance or going down to the you know the search list to see the new the latest new Chevy out on the lot alright so back in the day you a customer would go to a company to find out as much as they could about the, the, the product and what was going on the the company would supply the information and the expertise to make that purchasing decision and that's something that was there was no other way to do it other than showing up and talking about it. The customer would call, walk into your store, read your catalog, get your mail, see the newspaper, whatever uh, platform you were going through, um, and the com you as a company would be able to control what information was shared about the product. Now you still had word of mouth that would support what you were doing, but at that point customers trusted companies with their best interests. They expected, you know, 
General Electric to make the best products that would that would last and serve their needs. They would expect General Motors to be able to create a car that would get them from point A to point B without breaking down, doing the latest and greatest, and there was a sense of integrity. As time has gone on and we've learned more about uh, being able to communicate and we have this fabulous thing called the internet and we can all talk with each other, uh, the culture of transactions has started to change. And today's interaction is very different. Uh, what we're seeing, and, and we see this a lot in the retail world, is when a customer finally shows up at your door, um, they're ready to make a purchase. They usually might have a couple questions that they want to figure out, but generally speaking, they know more about your product than your sales team. Um, and that makes a really different way to start approaching um, just sales and marketing in general. Um, there's some really big things that we really like to start considering um, with the amount of research that that consumers are doing ahead of time. Where is that? Where is that research coming from? Where are they finding information? Where is it being posted? They are ready to make a transaction and not to make. A, they've already made the decision. And the biggest thing to take into consideration in thinking about today's consumer is today's consumer is skeptical and they trust themselves and their friends more than they're going to trust a company. Um, and so that's something to keep in the back of your mind when you're starting to think about your sales and therefore your marketing strategy. Alright, so sales versus marketing. In the past, this was also kind of blurred because you would your sales team would be doing part of the marketing as they were uh, relaying features and talking about the different products and services that you offer, but now we're seeing a really big separation before, between it. The the sales is the exclusively the transaction. Usually somebody's walking into the store, they're calling you up and they're ready to make a purchase. And the marketing is the position, the product positioning. And this is done usually without your involvement. Um, so that makes it a very different kind of world to be living in is thinking about what is that experience like when you're not there. Alright, so these are some things to consider as we're starting to, to work through what your social media plan is going to be for your company. If, if you don't get to have a conversation with the customer during the decision making process, what do you need to make sure that the customer knows about you and your product? And this needs to be like written at the top of anything you do to make sure that that's being conveyed. So think about when you do your, uh, you know, your elevator speech and you're doing your quick download, is that enough information to have somebody understand what's ha what's going on with your product and company? If it is, that's great. Now you need to make sure that that's being conveyed on social media, on your website, and that you're having really consistent messaging because you're, once again, as you're saying, you're not there to do that. The other thing you really need to start thinking about is where are your customers when they're looking for the product to solve their problem? So are they on the playground, you know, talking with other moms, trying to find out the latest and greatest, you know, educational tools? Are they uh, 10 o'clock at night, you know, just before they go to bed doing a last minute research to figure out, you know, they need a new type of insurance? Um, starting to figure out and getting into what we like to call the, the um, psychographs of your customers, not not just demographics of you know age, race, income, but what is it like to be them. So that's something we really want to start rolling into this because with social media, you are present in their lives. It's not an isolated incident. You know, they're on their phone, you know, sitting at a doctor's office. They're on their phone sitting in traffic, hopefully not <laughs> driving at the same time. But these are things that you need to start thinking about, not just um, the message that's going out, but what is that experience that your customer's in? Um, and then, then the, the big question is, how does social media help you get this message to the customer? How can you be present in those moments that they're checking their phone or their computer between things, and how does your product and what you've created um, engage with them and support what they need? Um, and because we want to make sure that, that not only is the, the social media informing people but also driving people to that ultimate goal which is a transaction. Um, so once a customer finally comes to you to make a transaction, take note about what questions and concerns they're actually bringing to you because this is good content that, that is possibly not out um, on social media, on your website, on review forums. So this is some really good content that you can start to use to generate some new ideas. 
Um, also, you want to start looking at are there questions and concerns customers have that you don't know about? Uh, this is this is a little tricky, uh, there's, but there's a lot of different forums that are out there today. We're starting to look at, all right, you know, what are some of the bad reviews? You know, why are they saying this? You know, not all bad reviews are worth engaging with, but it's worth taking note to see if there's something that you want to really uh, refine and convey in your messaging. And then it always comes down to, as, as we're talking social media, can social media help close the gap so that, you, so that you're, you're there for your customers in, a, in the way that they need you? Um, and that's really what it's coming down to is, is we really just have to understand the customer, what they need and when they need it. All right, so now that we've thought about the sales process, the marketing process, and, and where your customer is, before we get into the specifics, the next, the next thing that we want to start thinking about and considering is how do you want your followers to feel, interact, and connect with your posts? And this, so this gets into some branding, and, and not necessarily just you know what your logo is and, and, and how, what your sign looks like outside your business, but what I want you to start thinking about is how do they feel when they first experience their brand, and then what, when do they come back? And this is, this is something to start thinking about when you're experiencing other brands. You know, if you walk into a salon, or a, let's, say, let's do the massage studio, if it's really frantic and hectic and you're trying to go there to relax, you're not going to have a great experience, and that feeling is part of your brand. But if you walked into a, a massage salon where it's very calm and relaxing, and just that moment of walking in the door starts that process, that's a great brand experience. And those are things you want to start thinking about, um, because that's n not only something that you can control just within the four walls of your business, um, or when you have a salesperson who's interacting with potential clients, but also, how do you want people to feel when they're actually engaging with you on social media? And then the next kind of step into that is, if they feel a certain way, um, what do you want them to do? Thinking about how do you want to interact and connect with them? Do you just want them to follow you? Do you want them to um, have a conversation? Do you want them to just immediately make a transaction? So those are things to think about that process. We're not looking at specifics. We're just looking at the mechanics of what you want this campaign to do. So we're working through this structure. Um, and then the last thing that I really love for people to think about when you're doing this planning is, what do you want your customers to tell their friends after they ex have an experience with you? And that's something really neat to think about because it's not just what it's like today, but if they had such a great experience, what do you want that word of mouth campaign to look like? You know, I could go, uh, I, one of my favorite examples to use is actually Publix. Um, and for all of you in the Southeast, uh, you're going to be familiar with this, of being able to, their tagline is, uh, where shopping is a pleasure. And you get to experience that from every person in this huge grocery store, even the guy who is restocking the can of green beans, ask you how you're feeling. How are you, can I help you? And that is something with a smile. No attitude, no strings, just is there to help you. That is something that I tell people all the time if they're coming to the area, if they're going to go to a grocery store, uh, without hesitation, I send them there because I know that they're going to find what they need and they're going to have a great experience. So they've really thought through what that experience is going to be like. Um, and I'm always amazed by it, even if I'm having a bad day. Um, I'll go home and tell my husband that I, you know, I wasn't thinking about it, but it just made my day by going there. So those are things that you want to think about even before we're writing any content, before you're making a post, is what do you want that, that immediate feeling to be, what do you want that engagement to feel like, and then what do you want that aftertaste to be, so you know, beginning, during, and after. All right, so with social media, we don't get to do necessarily, you know, pretty, uh, you know, paint the walls a pretty tone and, you know, have a fragrance in the air and, and background music to help create the, the feeling of your brand, but there's something that we can really hone in on, and that's the tone that you're using when you're writing content. Um, and we're just going to go through a couple different examples just to get you to start thinking about when you're writing your social media, how does it sound? Um, and this is really important to start to consider, especially if you have multiple people writing for your campaign. You want to make sure that no matter who is speaking, uh, it has that same feeling. Because if you have something that's very, someone on your team who's very casual, and then you have somebody on your team who is very formal, it's going to send mixed signals. Um, there's a great example I like to use um, as about a barbershop. And uh, a 
this was a, walked into a barber shop and it was this great, amazing experience. It had like uh, a record player going. Everybody was hanging around, talking. It was very much like the quintessential barber shop experience. Uh, you know, the neighborhood kind of feel. Had such a great feeling there. Uh, you know, was one of those exactly what you wanted it to feel. You you had the great experience there. There was some great word of mouth that that got pulled in from that. Then they went back the second time, and the second time, there was no music. Everybody was rushing around, panicked, and and nobody was engaging with each other. It was like two completely different stores, and that was not necessarily dealing with the tone of the writing, but the tone of the atmosphere. And somebody had two completely different experiences because it was not established what the tone of that barbershop should feel like. So this is something to start thinking about when you're writing your copy, is what do you want your brand to sound like? Um, and so we're going to go through a couple different samples here. So if you want to do a formal uh, tone, which is sometimes really appropriate, uh, especially in the uh, financial areas. Um, you're going to use a more formal sentence structure and elevated vocabulary to establish uh, business as reliable, highly skilled, and no nonsense. So this is something that's that would be probably more B2B, uh, highly educated, um, and so you know financial companies, tech firms, educational institutions, uh, and certain professional service groups. So these are things to think about. You know. What demographic do you fall in? What tone should you be conveying? Because if you are um, very much laid back and a financial institution, that sends some mixed signals. Um, are they trustworthy? Do they have the same the rigidness that I want? Are they going to balance the books the way that they need to? So you want to make sure that the tone is matching your business. Another style is confident, and so this uses solid statements like Verizon gives you the power, or our network is the largest high-speed wireless network in America. It's, very, it's also active voice, um, so this establishes a company as highly qualified industry leader with a strong reputation and solid product offerings. So these are more statements. Conversational, uh, this is, this is going to read more like it's spoken, so this is going to be a more laid back kind of uh, approach to it. Uh, you might use a lot more contractions um, to make the tone more informal. This works really well with younger demographics uh, as well as products or services that are used by a broad base of the general public. So we want to make sure that if you're using something conversational, you're trying to reach the masses. You want the masses to feel like they can approach you and that they can talk to you. So this might be an approach, especially uh, for a lot of uh, retailers. This is something you might want to might want to consider. It just depends, uh, but that's something to think about. And the fourth one we'll talk about a little bit is the direct. Um, and so this is very, it's similar to the confident, but it's a little bit different. Um, it's very little comp copy, strong graphic presentation designed to capture your eye and deliver a message within seconds. Um, this is best used to when, you, when you want to deliver a very focused message quickly. Uh, it's effective when trying to reach younger demographics that is visually oriented and attuned to getting information in small focused packets. This is really well suited for uh, B2C products. So things to consider now that we've had to talk through some different samples of tone is what group or groups do you want to reach with your message? Um, and this is something that's really hard. It's, it's, we have a tendency to want to be everything to everyone. But when you're starting a campaign, is that really the strongest choice? And so one of the things that we always suggest when we're talking about social media is do one thing, do it really well, and then add to it. So that even includes, that can be just starting with Facebook and then adding Twitter, but that also could be focusing on moms and then focusing on whole families or whatever that demographic breach, breakdown is. Connect with somebody, get it in a solid place, and then add to it. Um, that being said, you know, talking about what is the demographic, so the specifics of these groups. Um, and you might have four or five different demographics that you want to reach out to. Some of them might have overlap and you might be able to reach out to a couple at the same time. Um, but some stuff that you really kind of want to think about is do all of your demographics uh, need the same same message and same tone. Uh, we work with a lot of nonprofits, and then this is when we'd have a mixed tone campaign. So if we're trying to reach out to, let's say we're doing an after school program for middle school kids, we're going to really want a conversational tone to engage with the students so that they're getting excited and they think we're cool enough to spend the time with us. 
But then we also need to have a more formal tone when we're dealing with um, educators. And let's say if we're trying to relate it to a school, and then on top of that, trying to get sponsors, so we're trying to reach out to corporate America, we're going to have two distinct tones. We're going to have one that's engaging the student, and then one that's engaging the educators and the um, sponsors. So that's something to think about when you're breaking out your groups, is what does each one of those groups look like? Um, that kind of rolls into some other things to consider, and we've talked a little bit about what does your industry look like. Um, that will give you some clues into the tone and the feeling that you want. Um, and then also, if, if, if we're talking to your client using your website or social media as a copy, as a script, how would you speak? So think about when you're actually engaging with um, clients or prospects, how do you talk to them? And that's something that should be taken into consideration when you're writing the tone and the copy uh, for your different social media. Um, and then I don't ever recommend that you use this as your complete basis, but it's always good to see what your competitors are doing. Um, do you want to be different? Do you want to be the same? I don't recommend copying, but it gives you an idea. It gives you a little bit of a baseline to make a good choice, to see if they're resonating. Are they engaging? Um, so that's something to definitely take into consideration as you're working through your campaign. All right. So engagement expectations. These are things to think about. How will your social media campaign improve your current company culture and bottom line? Um, so this is a little bit backtrack as you're thinking through the tone, but thinking about what is that? What does it need to do to actually engage with you? And then this is a really critical thing: is why are your followers going to actually want to engage with your campaign? If you just ask them to like it, it doesn't mean they're going to do it. There has to be a reason for it. So what is it going to take for them to get to that next step? And, that, and that's getting into the what do you actually need followers to do, and are you being clear about that? Okay. Um, this is Jessica here, and I'm going to jump in with uh, numbers three and four. And number three, this is uh, how, do, how do I set my expectations and goals for my social media strategy? Um, this... I feel like the biggest frustration that I hear from clients and peers when they either start a social media campaign or perhaps are dusting one off that, that didn't work a while ago is that they don't, they don't know if it's working or they don't know why it's not working. And it's because they haven't set any goals or expectations. You know, you see these international companies that have, you know, 500,000 likes and that looks like success. Um, but, you know, maybe your mid-size or small business it doesn't need 500,000 likes to be successful. Um, maybe it only needs 300 of the right people. So it's just a matter of setting those expectations and goals. Um, and I'm going to walk through some, uh, some key points to, uh, to set those goals and expectations. Am I not clicking in the right place? All right, there we go. <laughs> um, so the, really the very, very first step, again, whether you're starting out a new social media presence or you're you know, picking up one that you started a while ago, is picking what type of campaign you should launch. Now, if you have joined us either um, for our seminar back in, I believe it was May, or our workshop in June, you may have seen these slides. I'm not going to spend much time on them. Um, this presentation will be available after the fact. So um, if you need to go back and read these, there will be time. So don't worry if I go too quickly. Um, so the first kind of campaign style is awareness. And the umbrella goal here is just keeping your brand top of mind with clients and potential clients. Um, you're reminding them who you are, what you do, what services you offer, how you can help them. That's it. Just It's just an awareness campaign. Um, I think this is a really great place to start um, if you're in the beginning stages of a, a social media uh, presence for your business. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the next is experiential. This is taking it one step further and you know aiming for engagement from your audience. And you can set the bar low and hope for you know I'm gonna I'm gonna post this uh, and hopefully I'll get three likes from three real potential consumers. Or you know as you move along you can change the change the goal to <clears throat> uh, hoping for some feedback that you might throw out a question and, and hoping for some feedback on how you might steer your company moving forward. Your, the, the goal here is engagement. All right, the next is conversions. Um, and I don't recommend necessarily starting with this kind of campaign, but it's a good next step. Um, if you're moving out of awareness, this would be a good next place to go. Conversions, we are literally trying to 
convert the energy created on social media and take it somewhere else to get a transaction. Um, and that may be you know, converting somebody who likes your Facebook page and, and driving them to your online shopping cart. Or somebody that follows you on Twitter, converting it to the point where you can get their email address and you can send them newsletters. Or, you know, actually converting the, the relationship to them walking through the door and sitting down for a new business meeting. Um, and then the very last one is informational. Uh, this kind of social media campaign is often in support of a website. Websites are very important. Um, it's where you house most of your information. If you need a website, Amanda does a great job creating them. She did mine. I love it. But I know that my even most devoted clients are not going to my website every single day to see what kind of information I'm putting out there. But I do know that they're logging into Facebook and I do know that they're logging into Twitter. So if I have information, especially that's time sensitive, that I need to share, I'm going to make sure that it gets on, on social media before it gets on my website. Um, if you run any kind of business where uh, timing or event dates are important, or if you ever do, you know, a play-by-play -play in a live event, such as you know, if you're doing a live tweet or a live chat or an Instagram meetup, um, that would fall under the informational campaign as well. All right, so looking at those four basic kind of campaigns, compare it to your business, see what's a good fit. Once you have that. <clears throat> Once you have that campaign picked out, then you can begin to set goals. So if you're running an awareness campaign for your business, perhaps connecting with other organizations or businesses that might be willing to share your information, setting a goal of maybe connecting with two businesses this month that might do that. Or if you're looking for a conversion campaign, set the goal of connecting with 20 real potential consumers that might be willing to you know, join your newsletter list. Um, if experiential campaigns are a better fit, try posting some questions, and I would vet the questions first for sure, but posting some questions with the goal of gaining feedback that you can really use as you take the next step for your business. Um, once you get in the, you know, the stride of this campaign that you've chosen and setting these goals, sit down with your team and pick some realistic and obtainable weekly, monthly, and quarterly goals. Um, this will help you, you know, continue to move forward and, and uh, see what kind of progress you can make. Um, the real way to track goals, and especially if, you have, if you're the one running a social media campaign and you have to turn around and give a presentation to your higher-ups on why they should you know, keep the social media campaign going, the best way to prove your case is with analytics. Social media platforms really want you to use analytics because they want you to keep using their platforms. Um, so they're going to try to give you all the analytics that they can so that you can help prove your case to your boss and keep the campaign going. Um, I would consider creating a very simple, sustainable monthly report, something that is not daunting, but literally you know, inserting a table into a Word doc and tracking three or four items like how many likes you have this month or how many transactions you had. Uh, how many times your information was shared, whatever is important to you for your campaign, just creating a very simple monthly report. Um, I create some reports for clients that are seven and eight pages long, but it's taken us a long time to get there. Um, so start with something that's, that you know, is easy to, to, to handle in your busy schedule because I know that a lot of you, social media is not the only thing that you do. Um, Okay, so let's. We're going to very briefly go through these analytics slides. Again, if you've been with us before, you've probably seen these, and they will be available after the fact. Um, and a quick reason why they're important they help you better allocate your time, they show what you're doing right and wrong, and they help you track your progress. So, Facebook, Facebook's insights are, are pretty awesome. Um, they send you a, a snapshot essentially each week. Um, but you can drill down and, and get more insights. Twitter's insight analytics are a little bit more buried. Um, feel free to use this link and apply it to your account. Uh, it will give you, you know, a play-by-play -play of uh, favorites and retweets and replies for each uh, tweet that you send out. Pinterest, if you have a business profile, there is an analytics page. If you're a regular user, you're not going to find that, but there is one for business profiles. LinkedIn, same as Facebook, they're going to email you some stats. Uh, you also can log on and dig a little deeper on their site. Um, Instagram, it's still a little new in terms of uh, analytics. If you hover over the, the photo, it will give you how many likes and comments you get. Um, Tumblr, you can apply Google Analytics, which is awesome. 
Um, YouTube also has Google Analytics, which is very helpful. Vimeo has their own analytics page under My Stats. Uh, Google Plus obviously use, uses Google Analytics. And Vine is very primitive at this point in terms of analytics. Um, you just have to go to the post and, and see how many interactions you've had. Okay, so as we wrap up this section, it's really important with these goals, both in social media and in business, to be somewhat flexible. And do this with your eyes open. Look for trends and progress that might be taking off in a different direction, and hopefully a positive one, um, than what you intended. If you know, you're know you trying to run an awareness campaign, but you see conversions happening, go for it. Jump in there and, and take advantage of that. Um, also, you know, pay attention to your followers. See what they're telling you. See what the trends are. And again, using the analytics there, um, it, it really you may be able to adjust your goals and, and cover more ground quickly if you uh, if you pay attention to these items. Okay, so our very last section. Oh, great, we're doing good on time. Um, what's your brand story, and how do you want social media to deliver that message? If you're on this webinar, and I even do this for, as a living, this is the bulk of what I do. None of us have the time or capacity to reinvent the social media wheel, nor probably should we. Um, the only way to really be unique on social media is to be yourself. It's the one thing that you can be that no one else really can. Um, so as we're creating your brand story and how you can share that on social media, here we go. Um, I ask you to zoom in and literally take a look around your office. Consider creating content, and when I discuss content or copy, I'm talking about posts and tweets um, about the following. Perhaps your business history, where you've been, uh, how you got there. You've probably all heard of the trend Throwback Thursday. It's actually a really great place to do a little plug about you know who you are and, and where you came from in terms of your business. It may seem a little out of place if you just randomly sort of say it, but if you use it in the, the framework of Throwback Thursday, it's kind of fun. Um, think about also discussing individuals who make up your current team, as well as current or recently finished client projects you've completed. Um, and there's two rules for this. Make sure everybody's comfortable about it before you start talking about them on social media. Check with your, your team members, check with your clients, make sure everybody signs off on it. And the other factor to think of here um, if you are highlighting, you know, a really special team member who has, you know, a lot of experience or a client that you are continuing a relationship with, just be sure that, you know, you're in an environment where you don't think that uh, promoting them on social media might heighten the chance of them being poached by a, a competitor. That's the only thing to think about. I have a couple clients that don't want to talk about team members either, you know, in a 40 under 40 kind of list. It's like, why give them the spotlight if you feel like you might lose them? So it's something to keep in mind. But if you can highlight why your team is special, why you guys are unique, um, and you feel like you can do so in a manner that, that you don't have to worry about them uh, being stolen away, um, I think it's a, a really great way to, to show how you're special and how you're different. Um, also think about how your business has played a part in your communities, and that's your trade community as well as your local community. Why are you special? What role have you played? Um, again, no one else has that story but you, and that's it's a good way to be unique on social media. Um, all right, now zoom out and take a look at what's already out there on social media, and you're probably going to find just about everything. Um, think about how your message is different from what's already on social media. If it's not, that's fine. Probably not a shocking answer. There's so much out there. Um, is there a message strategy already out on social media that you would like to model your own work? And as Amanda said, you know, we don't want to copy, but if you can look at, you know, five or six social media campaigns and say, you know, I like, I like what they're doing here, I like this feature, I like that strategy, you know, you're welcome to learn from other people's successes and mistakes. Um, and then the final, does my message appeal to my followers' logic, emotions, or a mix? It's really how you angle what you're selling. Um, are you selling products and services where people are coming to you from a logical and practical standpoint? And this also kind of plays in with the tone information Amanda was discussing. Or are my, are my consumers coming to me um, looking for my products and services from a more emotional standpoint? Um, that's how you can really help you uh, frame your brand story as you move forward with creating content. Okay, so on the topic of that, here's some uh, helpful hints for content strategy. 
I hear all the time, you know, okay, I've got, I've got the Facebook page, I've got the Twitter account, I've got my profile picture. Now, what on earth do I say? And in addition to the, the brainstorming we did on your brand story, excuse me, um, let's consider these resources for content as well. Think about what services um, that you offer and how you can promote them on social media. And think about the services that you offer that maybe you know, aren't the first and second most popular on your list. Um, you know, this is a simple example, but if you're a cupcake factory and everybody knows and loves your cupcakes, but you also cater and do birthday cakes, talk about that. Use this platform, use this opportunity to talk about, you know, that second string of services that you offer and just make sure that your, your clients and your fans know that, that that's out there. Um, also think about news that you could share to promote your business on social media versus relying on traditional media. And here's what I mean by that. You know, if you've ever had a new service line or a new product or even just a new hire and you send out, you know, a, a soft pitch news release to your local publication and it's a hard news day and that story doesn't get picked up, it's incredibly frustrating. You know, you've put all this time and effort and fact checking and getting your whole story right and you pitch that, pitch it to your local news and they don't take it. Well, if you have a social media presence and you're connected to, you know, 500 of your consumers, putting it on social media arguably is, is getting more done than, than publishing it in a publication. And, you know, a big part of my job is traditional media, so I kind of hate to say that, but it's, it's partially true. If you know you can hit that target, target demographic, especially with, you know, the, the boosts that are out there on Facebook and sponsored uh, options for Twitter and Instagram, um, you know, it's it's kind of like you can really bypass traditional news altogether. Depending on the story, it's a case by case basis. But just think about that um, that tool in your arsenal when it comes to sharing news. Um, also, think about what news outside of the walls of your business, um, but related to your, your line of work, you can share. Now, if you read a national publication and they write, you know, an article on your trade, and it's something that's very interesting to you and very interesting to your your line of work and your peers and your clients, even though you didn't write the article, you know, as long as you give it its due, hey, I found this great article today, I felt like I should share it, you know, that's, it's a nice way to show that you're um, furthering your education, you're paying attention to what's going on in your field, and that you're up to date. It's going to remind everybody, not only are you up to date with what's going on, but you care about your profession and your trade. Um, also for content, consider, you know, posing questions that can get you good feedback. If you're thinking about, you know, opening a second location or rolling out another line of services, again, vet your questions, but this is a good place to, to call on your followers to, um, to give you some feedback that can help you make some choices with your business. Okay, a couple other quick factors to consider. If you've ever been on a, or been with us for a seminar, you've probably heard me talk about the 80-20 content split, and here's what I mean by that. Social media is a cocktail party. If you talk about yourself, 100% of the time, people are going to zone out, they're going to stop listening, they're going to think that you don't care about anything else, and they're going to move on and talk to somebody else. So if you spend 80% of your time talking about other factors, and that may be, you know, what's going on in your trade community, what's going on in your local community, um, you know, talking about your great clients or, you know, making a, a team member feel special because they achieved something, if that's 80% of your, your content, your audience will allow you 20% of boasting the good work that you're doing. Um, but again, it needs to be, and that, that fraction can be, you know, you can apply it how you want to, but it, it needs to be more talking about others and, and other good things going on and 20% boasting your work. Um, also think about what your competitors are posting. Um, for good, for bad, to make sure that you're different, to make sure you're somewhat in line with the rest of your field. Just pay attention to what others are saying. Um, also, social media really can make us all better writers. Um, ask yourself often, how few words can I use to deliver my message? Um, especially on Twitter, they give you 140 characters, and I think that the audience on Twitter almost expects the message to come with, with less than that. Um, you know, really see how much you can you can condense your message so that uh, you, you can hold your audience's attention. Um, and speaking of holding attention, this is our last slide. Um, think about also what kinds of posts are expected for uh, from your platform. You know, if you're on an image-based platform like Instagram or Pinterest um, or YouTube, you know, you 
you want to keep it in line with what's what's on the rest of that platform. What are people expecting on that platform? Um, also, what what is your audience expect? What does your specific consumer base expect uh, to see from from businesses like you? Um, and also, and this this sometimes can be a real game changer. What is the best time of day to post? You know, if you're if you're a lunch shop, you need to be sending you know tweets and posts out about 10.30 or 11 when people are starting to think about lunch in terms of what you've got to sell that day. If your audience is the type that's sitting down in an office from 8 to 5, you need to be posting it you know, when they first sit down at their desk around 8 a.m., when they're getting up to lunch at about 11.45, and about 5 o'clock when their day is ending, um, because that's probably when, well, it is when they're checking social media. Um, and analytics can help give you some insight into that as well. If you're trying to get someone's attention that's in an office and you know that they're busy posting something at 10.30 or 10.45, it's probably going to slip by and they're not going to read it. Um, so zone into your analytics and definitely pay attention to time of day. And I believe, there we go, that brings us to questions. Mm -hmm. So let's see what we've got going on. Um, here we go. We're a B2B company that takes a more formal approach to social media, but we also see the value um, in the aspect of being real to our consumer, customers. Excuse me. Is there a percentage of formal versus relaxed tones we should follow? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> all right. I don't think there's a real formula, but there is a balance. Absolutely. I think I would say it depends on the the topic at hand and what what the content's about. If it if you're say you're highlighting a team member or perhaps an event that you attended, um, I think you absolutely could frame it in a more relaxed fashion. If you're selling your products or services or perhaps talking about, you know, if you were in the news or got some coverage, I think in that case you could go a more formal approach. I would really let the content lead you, you know, what, what's the topic and, and let that take you from there. But I think that having a little bit of a mix is a good, a, a good balance and it keeps it fresh for your audience too. So that's a great question. Alrighty. Um, we had a question about Twitter changing the um, username. Oh, that's right. They wanted to change their um, username. So there's really, and this is a very um, logistical question, I guess, uh, or a very technical question. Um, it, it's pretty simple. Log into Twitter. You go to the settings. I believe it's a gear on the right-hand corner, and I'm doing this from memory, so don't hold me to it. Feel free to email us later if we didn't get it quite right. Um, there's a gear in the top-hand corner. You need to change it in two places. Under account, I believe you change it under name and then you go down to settings and change your username. And essentially what you're doing is you're changing um, the name and then the handle, which is has the little at sign in front of it. Um, and if, if that doesn't work, you're, feel free to email us and we can walk you through it. But that, that should be correct. Correct. Uh, the gear in the top right-hand corner, accounts and settings. Mm -hmm. um, okay, any email questions? I've not seen any others going through real quick. This one up top. Is that a follow up? Yeah, it was just a follow up. I think we got. So, if you guys have any other questions, just feel free to email or post them. One thing that I kind of think is worth bringing up because I think it's a great new trend and a great topic to talk about is this great new fad on Facebook, the ALS challenge with the ice box. Ice bucket challenge. Um, and I don't know how much you've dove into it, Jess, but it is pretty phenomenal. Um, and I only, I'll say, I only heard statistics last week on this, they um, had raised in three weeks $5.5 million, and I don't know about you guys, but my Facebook feed is inundated with people getting drenched <laughs> with ice water. Um, and I think one of the great things to kind of look at with this is is the, the viralness of what's happened with that. I don't know if you have any insights into it, but it's been pretty spectacular. I think it's a great example of an experiential uh, campaign and getting people to get up and engage. Um, so walking through um, walking through the process of being able to, uh, they're very clear about what they want people to do, 
that how that they should do it. So you're seeing all of these videos of people getting drenched and calling on other people to do it, either you know taking on the challenge or donating the money. So it's a great example of social media making a huge impact um, in, in ways that I know that they had no idea that it would take off like this. Oh, sorry, they're up to 15 million. There we go. There's our there's our update right there. Well, and it's a great example of social media being used by, you know, the regular user and then it peaking to hitting, you know, Jimmy Fallon and others that have such a yeah, I guess global reach really. And um and but but it still stays alive, you know, on on the grassroots side as well. So if that is an example of a, you know, a grassroots campaign then I I don't know what is. Um we do have one more question. Um Let's see here. I'm actually are there two. No, that's just what you watch. Okay. Um, this is from Courtney. I'm a photography company, and everything I do is image based, including what my followers see on Facebook. That's great. For the most part, I've noticed that followers want to see the work, not necessarily what's going on with me personally. Uh huh. Don't struggle. I don't struggle with FB interaction, but turning those into actual leads. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, hmm. It's, well, it's a challenge that even we as is being a service provider is they're not ready for your business until they're ready for your business. Um, and so what you really need to keep taking into consideration in for your social media campaign is being top of mind marketing so that when they are ready and need your photography services that you are the first pe person that they think of. And that's a lot of what you need to be looking at because it's not every day they're going to have an event or that uh, you know they're going to do annual pictures or whatever aspect of photography that that ties into your stuff, but that ongoing being out there on a regular basis, being consistent, shows that you're reliable, um, that you're staying current, and that you're out there. So the best advice I can give you is keep it up. Um, and you're right; they don't want to know as much about what's going on with you. They want to see what you're doing. And this is, as Jess was talking about, the cupcake factory uh, or the cupcake group. Is remind them of you know if you have a main aspect and service that you that you do. Is there other things that they might not be aware of? Um, and that's what leads into a lot of word of mouth. Um, somebody might be following you, and they say, "Hey, I have to take a product, or take some product pictures, and say, hey, my my." Personal photo, you know, our, our family portrait photographer also takes product shots. Here's her information. So those are things that you're looking for, and that's why we like to, to have you start thinking about what do you want that word of mouth campaign to be? What do you want people to tell their friends about? And that's when you start getting traction. That's when people start sharing and liking um, things that you've posted. So um, you're 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 doing you're doing the right things. And also, so your content, it's really, it, it applies to, to, to photos more so than the written word. Um, and I think that also just some strategic timing, you know, what's, what's coming up? Is it, is it family photos for the holidays? Can you share some from last year and, and send out that reminder of, you know, um, holidays are just around the corner. Be sure you book for your photo. And I, I don't know the time. It, that may not even be your product. But um, whatever it is, if there is kind of a trend um, in terms of the calendar year, just be sure that you're set up at the right time to, to remind people that you do that kind of work, um, whatever that kind of work may be, um, and, to, and to get on your schedule. Um, i trying to think what else would be a good... I, I think it's just probably a brand awareness kind of campaign, staying top of mind, reminding people of that second string of work that you do on top of what it's obvious that you do. Um, so if there's you know a second line of services that you take photos for, just be sure to remind people of that. Um, and this actually brings up a good a good topic. Um, in September, September 26, we are offering our second workshop on this. Um, it's a four hour course at least. We may even tweak the time, but it, it'll be at least four hours. Um, it went great back in June. Um, we had about five students. It's a really small class because it's very hands-on. Um, and we walk you through, basically you leave our, our presentation, our workshop, um, with a, a booklet that you filled out and a little bit of homework so that you can go home and just launch your social media campaign. And it's a lot of strategic planning, kind of like what we just did with, with, Courtney's, uh, with Courtney's question, but obviously on a much longer scale and we've got four hours to go over it all. Um, 
so we will today continue to answer questions uh, in the comment field on both Google Plus and YouTube, um, and we'll return emails as well. Um, we're going to do our best to get to everybody on that. Um, but also keep in mind, if you're leaving this presentation with more questions and answers, uh, the workshop in September uh, may be a good fit as well, and we will send out information with that uh, probably right after the Labor Day holiday. Um, so just keep an eye out for that if that's if that's helpful. Um, All righty. Do you have anything else to add? I think that's it for now. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. It's been a very exciting first webinar, and we will um, we'll talk to you all next time. Thank you so much. All right.